Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us in the world. And welcome back to our NGPA Up in the Air webinar series. My name is Brian Gambino, president of the NGPA, and I'm so happy you've all joined us here today. Almost 400 live attendees with us here. It's always a pleasure to have you here at these NGPA webinars. For those of you who've been following along since we launched this series in January, so much has changed across the world and the aviation industry. Things are trending in the direction of pre-pandemic life, and that is certainly a welcome sign for all. That last song that just played, it was so fitting for where we've come from and where we are now in regard to the changes in the world and of course aviation. Lost Frequencies was the name of that artist, odd enough in itself when we uh, talk about that in aviation, but he sings the tough road, the path traveled, which is representative of the past 16 months in the world and in aviation. He talks about gritting his teeth, bearing the pain and climbing the mountains once again. I rise, he says. When I heard this song, I said, this is so appropriate for this past year. And I knew we had to play it on today's webinar. I also really liked the beat, so that helped too. The world continues to make the positive shift towards returns to normalcy. And the world of aviation has seen the swing of this pendulum in very rapid form the past few months. It's exciting, it's reinvigorating, and ultimately it means career placement, career progression, and new opportunities are once again back on the menu. We can all certainly celebrate that. Before I turn it over though to today's featured Up in the Air presenters, I wanted to remind you all about who the NGPA is. We are the worldwide LGBTQ aviation community. We're now over 2,700 members strong and we represent, advocate for, and foster a family for the LGBTQ plus aviators across the globe. We also welcome and embrace those who do not identify as LGBT, but rather are a part of that plus. We call you allies, and we're so excited to continue to grow our ally population every day. And we welcome you to become an ally member of NGPA or a regular member of NGPA to be part of our ever-growing organization. Your membership supports the work that NGPA does to advocate for the LGBTQ plus community supports our advocacy efforts. It supports events, both in person and ones just like this, this Up in the Air webinar series, which we've been hosting for over six months now. You can head to our website, www.ngpa.org, and click the Join Now button. It's in the top right portion of the screen. Fill in the information there. Join. We have memberships that start at $20 for students, $49 for individual members. That gets you membership and access to a whole slew of benefits, as well as discounts to attending our events in person. If you aren't ready to become a member, but you do want to support NGPA with a donation, you can do that uh, pretty easily right now. Pick up your smartphone and you can send a text to the number 44321, just typing into that message, the word NGPA. So again, you can type NGPA and send it to the number 44321. You'll get a link back right away with a way to donate to the organization, support our advocacy efforts, support our work, support our Up in the Air webinar series. We truly appreciate all of the support you've given to NGPA over the past few months, the past years, and we look forward to welcoming more of you into our organization and seeing you at our in-person events in the future. Enough for me, it's time to talk about our today's presenters and that's our friends and our Diamond Elite sponsors at American Airlines. American Airlines was founded in 1926 in St. Louis, Missouri as American Airways and they commenced operations in 1936. Fast forward in over 90 year history through mergers, acquisitions and incredible growth. American Airlines is now the world's largest airline servicing over 350 destinations across the globe with a fleet of close to 900 aircraft and employee group over 130,000 team members strong across their global network. Headquartered in Fort Worth, Texas, American, along with their regional partners, operate a robust international and domestic network with close to 6,000 daily flights. Here to represent American Airlines today is an incredible team who keep things running smoothly within the flight operations department. Shortly, I'm going to be introducing Vice President of Flight Operations, Captain Chip Long, Director of Pilot Recruitment and Development, Captain Corey Glenn, as well as Managing Director of Pilot Recruitment and Crew Accommodations, Captain Lori Klein. But there's no better person to introduce the American Airlines team and the entire American Airlines family than the CEO himself. So to all of our attendees here, please welcome to our Up in the Air virtual webinar stage, the Chairman and CEO of American Airlines, Mr. Doug Parker. Doug. I hand it to you. Hi, I'm Doug Parker, the CEO of American Airlines. Welcome to the latest installment of the National Gay Pilot Association's Up in the Air webinar series. 
We all know it's been a tremendously challenging year for so many, including those of us in the airline industry. We saw travel demand drop off quickly, the world shut down, and so many people, both directly and indirectly, affected by the virus. As we look back, I'm incredibly proud of the way the American Airlines team led through this crisis and continues to deliver. When most of the world was paralyzed with fear last year, our team kept the country moving by showing up to work every day and safely transporting medical personnel, supplies, and customers where they needed to be. We're seeing glimmers of light as more and more people return to the skies. And that's a good thing for those of us in the industry and for anyone pursuing their dreams of becoming an aviator. You'll hear more about that from my colleagues in the flight department. But before I pass it over to them, I want to leave you with, with a few thoughts. As an airline, and frankly as a world, we are better when we are diverse and inclusive. We have a responsibility to lead the airline industry in all ways. And as a global company, we have a unique opportunity to serve as a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's inherently who we are. We fly over borders and walls and stereotypes and divisiveness to bring people together. Our work makes the world a smaller, more inclusive place. But importantly, that work doesn't end. Diversity, equity, and inclusion must be continuously fostered through tough conversations, empathy, and action. That's something the NGPA does so well. They've done tremendous good in communities throughout the United States and around the world, leaving a positive impact both on individual lives and our industry. The NGPA has made aviation a better industry, an American a better airline. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. So thanks to the NGPA for everything it's doing to move our industry forward, including by hosting webinars like this. And thanks to all of you for participating today. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Doug, thank you so much for that great introduction, for welcoming uh, our American Airlines team to our Up in the Air webinar, and for your outstanding support for diversity, equity, and inclusion across American Airlines, and specifically your support to the NGPA. For those of you here in the webinar, I'd like to hand it over to the American team and handing it over to the Vice President of Flight Operations, Captain Chip Long. Chip, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. Brian, good afternoon, and thanks for having me. I'll take uh, just a couple minutes uh, tucked in between uh, Doug and my terrific team of uh, Lori and Corey, uh, just to give you a kind of an update on flight. Uh, Doug said a few things about the airline. Uh, if I could characterize what's going on in flight right now at American Airlines, I would say it's literally an all hands on deck moment or summer or season for us. Uh, the snapback in demand has been astonishing. You and I talked about that for a moment before we came on live. Uh, I think everyone predicted that there was pent up demand. Nobody, I don't believe, predicted that it's been to the, uh, the level that it has. And so that's created all of its own challenges, all good challenges to have, but there's hiring associated with that. There's training. Uh, there's the schedule we're trying to fly. Of course, if you've got uh, uh, bases in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Charlotte, Miami, then you've uh, seen a lot of IROPs, a lot of weather uh, complications from that. And of course, vendor staffing is a big issue, I think, for all the airlines. So all, all that just to say that it is one of those summers, but we are so glad to be back flying. Um, I did take a moment before, uh, uh, you know, as I was considering uh, the webinar, just to reflect on some of the pre-COVID momentum that I felt we had at American. There was some really exciting moments. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago that I was up in Philly the summer of uh, 19. It was in June. And uh, in the gate, uh, festive gate and boarding area, as we were getting ready to launch uh, one of our flights from uh, Philly to LaGuardia in uh, celebration of the anniversary of Stonewall in June of 69. Uh, that summer, uh, throughout June, we had some of our, our chiefs at some of the pride parades uh, in uniform uh, throughout, uh, throughout our system. Uh, and then uh, one of my favorite memories was the Palm Springs warm up. I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe late January of 20. But uh, I was there along and met many of you uh, and, and brought my chiefs uh, to Palm Springs. We had a terrific time was so impressed by the organization, your leadership, your professionalism, uh, what you're doing out there for, for our profession. Uh, got to see uh, you all honor uh, our good friends, uh, David Pettit and Jan Anderson, uh, and then hand off the leadership to you, Brian and Troy. Uh, that was just uh, terrific. And then everything changed. Uh, COVID shut 
shut us down essentially as an airline. We all remember, for me, it was March 16th as demand just plummeted. But we were busy in the time we weren't flying at American Airlines. Um, we had a course that we were uh, giving all of our pilots uh, based on implicit bias, unconscious bias. We called it disrupting everyday bias. And in that quiet time when demand was down, I used uh, David Pettit and the terrific team that he's part of to create new content for our pilots as we uh, had a sequel to that. We call that the Pilot Culture Advantage. And uh, that's just a terrific course that all our pilots are getting uh, right now, very creatively put together. Uh, but this is uh, the last day of June. And so I had an announcement uh, posting at AA Pilots for our pilots uh, as we uh, remembered uh, coming up on 20 years ago, 9-11, and our first officer, uh, David Charlebois, in uh, Flight 77. And the, as I uh, addressed our pilots, I closed with this, and I'll read this, Brian. Uh, in closing out Pride Month, I want to acknowledge the LGBTQ plus professional pilots of American Airlines and express my deep appreciation to them and their allies at every base and on every fleet in our system. Your inclusion and fairness journey has made American Airlines a safer and more respectful place to work. And that's really the closing thought that I wanna leave with you and, and, and your team and, and all those that are watching, Brian, is that American Airlines flight leadership has a deep respect and appreciation for the compounding effect of your journey over the years and the way that you all have led with your uh, values of fairness and inclusion. And that has rubbed off on your allies and the rest of us. And it's making our workplace, honestly, a better place to be. So I just want to say thank you, uh, Brian, to you and Troy and Stephen and Scott, and for giving me a couple minutes. I'm going to hand it off right now to my managing director of pilot recruiting and development, uh, Captain Lori Klein. So Lori, if, uh, if you'll take it from here. Thank you, Captain Long, I sure will. And uh, indeed, his comments couldn't be more uh, on point. We're, uh, what a great way to close out Pride Month. Um, we're happy to be joining you today. We're very busy here in the pilot recruitment area because we had closed the office as a result of COVID and we still had a lot of pilots in the pipeline. So we're busy, Corey and I, uh, getting everything ginned back up to invite them back in and start the classes again. That's gonna happen in the fall. Uh, and we'll be starting to do some new interviewing uh, into the next year. But what a, what a great time to be getting together. I hope next year we can do it in person, but for now we'll, we'll suffice this webinar. What a great idea and a great way to connect with everyone. Uh, we're happy to be supporting you and our continued effort, right, uh, of gaining equity and inequality in the flight deck. Um, we know for certain that flying knows no gender. It knows no ethnicity. It knows no sexual orientation. And together we hope to bring about change in the industry in the most impactful way um, by selecting the diverse culture of our pilots so that anybody that wants to choose a flying profession can feel uh, a safe and supportive environment to do just that. And we've highlighted a great uh, progress for you in the presentation that's gonna follow and I hope you'll enjoy it and learn a lot from it. And I'm gonna turn it over to our director of Pilot Recruitment, Captain Corey Glenn. Thank you so much, Lori and uh, Chip. I'm very pleased to be here with uh, the entire team. And again, most of you know our longstanding support and collaboration with NGPA and, and mutual support both, both directions. So I am going to go right into a presentation here. Um, just to run through some of the basic, hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have pent up over the last year, couple of years, to know a little bit about us. But uh, there's just some basic information about the, the three of us, all three of us, uh, as Brian mentioned, are, are captains for the airline. We are all three actively flying. Chip and I both are captains on the 737 and Lori is a captain on the Airbus and uh, has, has a longstanding history of being really involved in the development of the Airbus program, as well as the, uh, the, the training that goes into that. So um, we're excited that uh, our flight leadership has put together such a, an amazing team. And uh, as you can see, we have all a very diverse background that we bring in to 
go forward as we look at hiring our future pilots, as well as developing those who have yet to become pilots. So as we move to the next slide, we'll talk to you a little bit about uh, our in the past 95 years. Uh, obviously, Brian mentioned in 1926 when the airline began, some of the bigger landmark staples along the way is um, in 1964, you'll see that American was the first airline to hire uh, African-American pilot, Dave Harris. And then as we moved forward, uh, the Eagle product was launched in the 80s, uh, mid 80s there. And then of course, uh, we talked a little bit about um, the tragic events of uh, 2001 and, and the loss of family members in, in that process. But we moved forward, we got to a period of uh, consolidation and mergers and in 2013, they emerged between US Airways and its consolidated airline and American uh, occurred. And then uh, we moved forward to 2019 when we were really on a fast track of uh, hiring. We were really reaching the uh, a long-term apex of retirements for pilots. Uh, and then that came to a, a very quick halt in March of last year. We're now back in a recovery phase here. Uh, we've seen domestic leisure come back, starting to see a little bit of short haul international come back. Uh, what we're really looking forward to, and this is no secret, but the, the, us as an industry, we make our money with the business partners out there. And those business partners have started making commitments to us to come back to travel. And we're starting to see that happen slowly. Uh, and as that continues to come back, we'll also see our long, long haul international flying uh, slowly come back over the next few years. But right now we're seeing that domestic leisure really has picked up with that pent up demand. So you heard us all talking about diversity and I can attest firsthand that that is something that is high on the important list for our airline. It is, it is a value, it is not just a, an initiative. It's a, it's a value of American Airlines. It's who we are and what we have uh, to support that is uh, along with other companies out there do have business resource groups, but American has several business resource groups that are very robust and embrace all of the differences that all of our employees bring to the table because we know those differences compiled together make us a stronger, better airline and a better service platform for our customers. Uh, as we move on through the slides here, the you can see we've, we've gotten several awards for the past of being in the inclusive index, uh, getting the best practices awards, um, uh, some for inclusion of disabled as well as diverse employees and might see some recognizable faces in this picture, but really it is, like I said, this is just reiterating the value this has in American and how it is embedded in our culture. This is actually one of the mission statement values for American is making culture a competitive advantage. And that this is the anchor point for, for that is because it is such a high value, this is exactly where we are putting so much effort in the past and coming forward, where you're seeing increased initiatives and increased new ideas being introduced into all the different facets of the airline to ensure that we are making this the best place for not only diverse, diverse pilots and diverse employees, but also for our customers who are equally diverse. So that leads me to the next slide where we'll talk a little bit about why, what are some reasons you might wanna work here? Um, one of the things we did over this last year uh, is we consolidated our fleet. We're down to four main aircraft fleet types. Uh, two narrow body and two wide body. What that does is it, it gives a very definitive pathway for you to choose as far as your pilot career here. And it also gives us the dynamic ability to really shift our flying to the best fit for the type of aircraft and the type of crews that we need to cover the certain type of uh, passengers as well as routes. Next slide. And this is the breakdown. So. The big takeaway out of this is that we went through that consolidation process, was actually initiated about five years ago. We deferred some of that, uh, consolidated some of the, that in the last year, and actually brought some forward uh, retirements last year into 
into last year from future years. But what that really did is it just narrowed down the aircraft types we have. As you can see, there's only about 90 actual different uh, difference of about 90 aircraft between 2019, which was our peak before those retirements, and today. And as we go forward into the next few years, we have several more uh, aircraft orders that you can see there in the bottom right hand corner that show how much our fleet growth can be uh, or is anticipated to be in the next four to five years. Next slide. Uh, uh, of all the uh, airlines out there and legacy airlines included, we have the most spaces uh, and, and they're all relatively ideal living locations. So we have good representation on the East Coast, West Coast and Central US, but there are where all of our current uh, domiciles and hubs are. And as you know, our primary operating hubs right now, our most flying occurs out of Dallas and Charlotte. And as the business demand comes back, we'll start seeing the, the Washington DC area and the New York area bases start to recover uh, as well as Chicago for our international long haul. You'll see also that we'll have some flying and long haul flying out more of the West Coast that will be based out of LA. Next slide. So where is everything live for our competitiveness and hiring? We, as I mentioned before in 2019, kind of reached our uh, the beginning of the apex of uh, the hiring curve for us. That 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 was looking to be about a six or seven year time frame, but really a more than decade long um, record setting hiring pace that we were on, and and we're still on that path. This last year of COVID just put a little bit of a, a damper in that, but it did also accelerate some of the retirements. So. We ended in 2019 with uh, just over 900 pilots hired on board. So you can see the majority of those pilots, just a slight majority came from our flow through programs with our wholly owned regionals. Uh, but as that shifted into 2020 and going forward, it's actually shifted more towards our selection process. And all of our wholly owned regionals, uh, there is no exemption for them in that selection process. They, they can choose to wait until their flow date, but they can also choose to be competitive pilots and apply directly as if they were an out external candidate and have an equal opportunity at uh, being selected prior to their flow date. Uh, we're, we've announced that we're gonna be hiring 300, probably a little bit over that uh, towards the end of this year, and then at least double that next year. Next slide. So the big questions that I get all the time, what, what do I need to get com be competitive? Usually it's a lot more specific about how many hours do I have to have as a minimum to be uh, chosen to get interview with American Airlines. And that's a lot more complex. We focus, uh, it seems cliche, but we do focus on the entire person concept. And some of those things that make up uh, a very competitive applicant are listed here. But probably the number one thing that disqualifies someone or knocks them out of even being looked at is that not taking the time to frequently update your application. And that update is not just updating your times or putting in, I just flew a trip, so I did eight legs and I'm gonna update those flights. It's really, it's spending this six or seven minutes a week to go through and comb through your application to look for errors, omissions, uh, sometimes things as simple as updating the passport expiration date or your medical expiration date. Those things, if they don't, don't look current, have nothing to do with your time, but our system is not going to bring that application forward for us to review. Uh, the other piece that's a, a big part of that um, uh, is that you have some letters of recommendation, at least one from someone internal that preferably has flown with you, but they can speak to your character. That is, uh, that's really what we look for in our initial screening. We have currently almost 10,000 applications on file. About a third of those are competitive applications. And we're only able to go through 40 to 60 applications at a time when we choose and when we resume interviewing. So that's the best way, it's just these 10 steps here. This is the best way to get highlighted and, and get that call from us earlier than later. The big reason why, uh, as we all know that uh, pilot seniority is everything. Right now, even with the early retirements that we have, we're still expecting to have 
mandatory retirements of over 50% of our pilot size in the next eight years. So great opportunity for advancement, great opportunity for going to the base aircraft and seat of your choice in the next 10 years by being hired by American in the next year to two years. So one of the things that is a dynamic that's occurring now that has been kind of uh, building up in these black swan events every decade has kind of postponed that a little bit, but it is imminent that we are at a point, the first time in history where the shortage in the pilot supply is less than the pilot demand for the next five to 10 years. And that demand, actually, there are several studies out there. We have the Oliver Wyman here, which was the most recent uh, significant study put forward, but shows that that demand actually happening here in the next three years and not actually ever catching up with the supply unless we do something to catapult and, and to uh, be a catalyst to stimulate more pilot generation. So that brings us to the, uh, the next point here, which is um, we have part of our pilot recruiting team is not just bringing pilots in that are eligible and ready to come to work for American, but also recruiting into the career field. So we, we're starting at square one. And for us, we truly believe that begins in school. That begins in middle school, high school, helping people become educated on this as a, as a viable career, as an opportunity to get into the cockpit of an airplane at a sooner point in life and have a, a very robust and long lasting career. And also we spend a lot of this time and energy reaching into communities that have been underserved in the past and, and don't necessarily have that legacy opportunity to have a parent or a grandparent that was involved in aviation and giving them those opportunities. And so ways we've done that is we've distributed uh, over a million dollars over the last four years in, in grants and scholarship funds. Obviously uh, some of those scholarships have gone through in GPA. We also have um, worked with AOPA and helped fund the cornerstone of building their You Can Fly curriculum, which is a curriculum aimed at high schools around the country. And they can enter as a freshman when they, by the time they finish their senior year, if they've done all four years of the curriculum, they've completed all of the ground school for in, instrument and private and instrument training. So it's a, a pretty great initiative. And then reaching out to several schools that uh, serve under represented communities. And then feeding into that, we have our American Airlines Cadet Academy, which was really the first um, from a legacy carrier to have a program that has actively produced and continually producing new pilots uh, on a regular basis. So the concept came up and, and was designed back in 2016, and we were able to get it launched and refined and uh, about this time in 2018, so three years ago. And then uh, we had our first cadet that made it all the way through the program in March of last year. It actually started with one of our wholly owned regionals at Envoy. Unfortunately, it was furloughed during COVID, but the good news is he's back in training in two weeks and as a, as a jet pilot for Envoy with an opportunity to flow or get hired uh, in front of the flow with American. We have over 400 cadets that are in the program or have started the program right now. Uh, just under 400 are still enrolled in the program with more than half of those in what we call the hour building phase. So we'll go to the next slide here. Um, and this is, these are our phases. So we have four phases. Uh, the first phase is getting through their ratings. It's basically taking anyone from zero hours up to instrument can enter the program and then that takes them all the way through their flight ratings to include uh, CFI and I. At that point, we've partnered with not only our cadet schools, but some of our other, some other school partners out there for them to enter into uh, flight training jobs as flight instructors to build time to meet the requirements to earn their ATP. And um, part of that is we do have some unique financial uh, partnerships that allow us a very unique design program that allows our cadets to easily qualify, be selected and pay for their training up front with no out of pocket costs uh, until they are sitting in the right seat of a jet aircraft in one of our wholly owned airlines. And then the repayment process timeline 
is stretched out enough so that it doesn't impact your quality of life while you're you're flying at a regional airline. The other, uh, the third, that's the third step. And then the fourth step is, is obviously coming on board as an American Airlines pilot. Uh, though there are several programs that tie into that. So we have the initial program with our two flight schools, um, four locations, that's uh, CAE and Phoenix. And then we have close flight training in San Diego, California, San Marcos, Texas, as well as here in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And then they go through flight training. Uh, once they finish that flight training phase, it's scheduled to be right at about a, a year, but obviously we know that weather and other things can impact that timeline. So usually you're finished with that in, in no more than 14 months. Then they move into that hour building phase where they're flight instructing. They have the opportunity to not only, like I said, flight instruct those schools, but they partner with our wholly owned regionals, Envoy, PSA, and Piedmont. And they have, you can see a numerous a number of uh, flight schools and universities that they can go flight instruct at to build time that leads direct entry into one of those wholly owns. Next slide. Like I said, almost 400 uh, current cadets in the program. Uh, what you haven't seen is that what we can measure for diversity are um, people of color as well as women. Over 53% of the ones that we currently have enrolled uh, meet that category. Our actual diverse category, uh, diverse number, diversity numbers are higher than that. But that's that's what we're able to to measure across the board and and report on the um, cadet programs. You can see we have uh, almost 60 cadets that are enrolled in our partner cadet programs with our holy owns. Next slide. These are just a couple of uh, excerpts of some of our um, cadets that have finished the training, build enough hours to qualify to go to or almost qualify to go to one of our holy owns, there's somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 hours of total flight time, and just a little bit of a, a, their story on their experience in the cadet program. Wide variety of, of backgrounds that people come into. Some of them have come straight out of high school. Some of them are changing careers, uh, and then the program is open to all. Next slide. Just some more features of our uh, cadets and training. And um, I think if you ask any of our cadets, they will tell you what an amazing experience and a very fast timeline that they've been able to accomplish their ratings in. And, and this is really our, our goal is, is not just make American Airlines pilots, but to incrementally grow the entire pilot population for the industry and ensure that we infuse diversity in the process. That's something that we've seen that there's always some been a relatively narrow focus on where pilots have come from. And a lot of that comes from, again, the, the legacy of having a family member or a parent that was a pilot and getting that exposure. So this is giving that exposure opportunity to people that typically haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to aviation. These are the ways to contact us. So if you're interested in uh, have additional questions beyond today or just wanna reach out and contact our department, you've got uh, the way to apply there, the aa.pilotcredentials.com. That's to apply to be a pilot for American Airlines. Currently our applications are only open to those who already had applications on file. That is to say, if you've already filled out the application, you can continually update that. But uh, we are expecting sometime uh, about a month from now, in the next three to four weeks, to turn on uh, the website to allow you to submit a new application. So we're just doing some fine tuning under the hood. We've revamped the platform that we do our applications on to make it a much more user-friendly interface and uh, rolling out some future enhancements that should allow it to be a little bit easier because that, uh, for me, that was always the most daunting thing to apply was trying to make sure that I got all the information on my application to highlight the things that I thought was important and that I thought the hiring airline thought was important. So we're trying to make that a lot more user-friendly and get away from the historical uh, matrix, we'll call it, 
of having a real difficult time making your logbook match what the information we're looking for. So um, you'll see some of those enhancements. And, and as we move forward in the next 18 months, more of those enhancements will roll out just to make it a, a much more user-friendly interface. And then for the Cadet Academy, uh, the application is embedded in the website. So for those that are interested in not yet pilots, but becoming pilots, uh, I certainly encourage you to go and just explore and look around on the website to just learn about what it is, what it offers. And, and if you have individuals that are just looking for a way to get into being a pilot and they didn't have access or don't have access, then maybe the, some of the tools you had, this is just another resource that they can use to get into training without really having to be overly concerned about the cost of entry. And then uh, as far as emailing us, we've got the pilot.recruitment at aa.com as well as cadetacademy at aa.com. And we monitor those. I see those emails on a regular basis and our entire team is dedicated to making sure that we respond to you. So with that, we'll move into question and answers. Corey, thank you so much for the presentation. Definitely appreciate all of that information. Uh, very informative as we, uh, uh, that that pendulum swings back to the job progression, job positivity in aviation being back on the menu. Um, definitely exciting time. So good to hear uh, history of American Airlines, where American Airlines is going, uh, what they've done to prep for the uh, return to a, a massive amount of flying, and how people can start looking forward to joining the American Airlines team in the future. One of the one of the most incredible things that even strikes me is how you talk about that fifty percent of the pilot group that is currently flying at American Airlines is projected to need to have to retire 65 mandatory retirement age in the next, did you say nine years? Yeah, that's right. Eight, actually just under nine. So about eight years, more than, more than 50%. Wow. Uh, that number there, uh, that's just staggering. And I can't even imagine the, the onus or burden that is on you and your team to make sure you're able to fill all of those seats uh, <laughs> to make up for that. So uh, pretty cool. Pretty uh, pretty great outlook for American Airlines in terms of pilot hiring, especially uh, growth and progression within the American Airlines family. Um, question and answer time. That's what we're going to shoot into. Corey, um, you're going to be in the hot seat. We've got a bunch of questions that have come in here. We're going to get to those in just a second. I want to make mention of one thing, going back to what um, Captain Chip Long was talking about when he was here. Uh, for those of you who are joining on the call, many may not know, um, yes, we're ending Pride Month today and American release statements in regards to that today, as well as a fantastic article about American Airlines' own pilot, who was the first officer on Flight 77 uh, that crashed on September 11th. Um, also, an NGPA member, David Charlebois. He was uh, a founding member, not a specific founding member, but he was one of the very early members of NGPA, uh, going back 31 years in our history to the 1990s. Um, and he was a pilot on American 77. And there's a fantastic article that was put out by American Airlines Corporate Communications today featuring David Charlebois, featuring his history, his legacy, his time at American, the things he did and worked on back in the 90s uh, for LGBTQ inclusion. Um, and I recommend you check it out. You can see it across American's website under their corporate communications and press release information. Um, definitely check it out and learn more about NGPA member David Charlebois and an incredible American Airlines pilot who unfortunately lost his life. Um, on September 11th. So thank you to the American team for featuring him and uh, continuing that great relationship here with NGPA. So on the question and answer portion, you can enter your questions there. You can upvote. All of you will be able to see the different questions that are listed there. Click the thumbs up if that's something that you want to ask too, and we will be pulling from the most upvoted questions as we continue forward. To help me out with that, my trusty sidekick, none other than uh, NGPA Vice President Troy Merritt. Good afternoon, Troy. Welcome. Thanks for joining hey, us. Hey, Brian. Thanks for uh, letting me help you with the question and answer. Uh, we've got quite a few here. It looks like we've got a little over 30 questions. Probably won't be able to get to all of them. A lot of them are similar. Um, so we're going to let Corey kind of bat at those here and uh, try and get through them. Like Brian said, um, take a peek at the Q&A box, see what questions you want answered. If your question's not there, go ahead and add it. You can upvote other folks' questions. That'll help us get to them earlier. Um, unfortunately, we probably won't be able to answer every question in the box, but we are going to do our best. Corey, are you ready for the first question? Yeah, let's go. All right, first question here um, is, any chance that the flow um, for wholly owned carriers uh, will increase over the next year. It seems that wholly owned carriers will be trying to send 
to try and hold on to as many pilots as they want. What, uh, what's your plan for flow there? That's a good question and, and one that comes up frequently and, and there's a little bit of mystery that always uh, goes around that flow agreement because we are the only legacy carrier that currently has a flow that's been instilled for the last few years. And so uh, two pieces of that. Uh, the first part is that the flow is actually regulated by their the, the union collective bargaining agreement. So there's nothing that us and the pilot hiring or recruitment have other than facilitating the uh, agreement and and meeting the terms of the flow agreement. So we can't turn it up or turn it down. That has nothing to do with what we do. Uh, we we can't say, no, we were not going to flow this month because the contract doesn't allow it. So we comply right. with that contract and that number, as far as I know, is, is stayed at a fixed rate. Uh, we are currently, are even with the reduced hiring that we had last year and the reduced hiring uh, that we'll have later this year from years past, we're still at the point that that variable rate is is max maxed out. So the maximum amount of pilots that can flow from each wholly owned will be flowing each month that we hire. Absolutely. Uh, going forward, the other part of the answer that, of that is that the flow is not the only way that we source pilots from our wholly owned. The other way is, as I mentioned before, is, is what we would uh, affectionately call the front door and coming through the application process. And I can tell you from, from our perspective, we have every intent to offer the most highly competitive pilots from our wholly owns an opportunity to get hired at American just as they would with, with any of our other uh, competitive legacy carriers out there. And, and quite frankly, if they're a great asset, we're going to want to grab you before they do. So um, for those of you that fly for our current, currently fly for our wholly owns, I highly encourage you to, uh, to either update your application or fill out an application. Once that gets turned back on next month and and we are excited to see you and welcome you into the right seat of the American Airlines aircraft. Awesome. Thanks, Corey, for that. I'll hand it to Brian for the next question. Well, thanks, Corey. And I know that covers a couple of other uh, questions that were down the line, Troy. I know some, uh, some folks are asking, can you apply outside of the flow agreement if you're part of an American wholly owned? And Corey, just answered that. The answer is yes. So make sure you update those applications. If you are an American wholly owned with plans to flow and a flow number, however that may work out, uh, definitely apply outside of that as American opens their application window for exterior applicants next month. So be on the lookout for that. This question, very much upvoted. And you know what? I'm glad that I get to ask it. It's, a, it's an easy, quick question, but probably not an easy answer. Corey, how many pilots is AA looking to hire in 2021 and then how about 2022? Do you have a forecasted number for this year and for next year? For this year, as I mentioned, uh, we, are, we are over 300 pilots. Uh, we don't have a specific number. And even if I did have that, we probably would be, that changes on a regular basis, just like our demand does for, for flying. So our network is, uh, we have, uh, from my perspective, some of the best folks in charge of operating and designing our network fleet capacity as well as root structure. And they are actively fine tuning that. And every day that that changes, that changes our projections. So whatever I would say today, that number would change by a few numbers tomorrow, change by a few numbers a few weeks from now. But I can tell you confidently that it's over 300 this year and, and definitely double that next year. It could be even more than that. But looking at the amount of retirements that we have coming forward in the next eight years, and even the next three or four years, you can expect some very high, probably industry leaning uh, numbers as far as hired pilots. Cool, no, thank you. So 300 this year and up in, and double that, if not more next year, that's uh, definitely just goes right in line with the amount of retirements that you talked about and the exciting times for those who, uh, who will start their careers at American. Troy. Yeah, Corey, yeah. Uh, the question here from Michael, uh, how is the pilot skill selection of the application scored and how does that affect your application specific application question there? Sure, so just to give a little bit of backstory there. So we, we made some uh, under the hood changes as I mentioned, and that was one of them. So over the last year, and this was something that had been planned to roll out uh, before COVID occurred and COVID, the, um, the COVID pandemic actually just allowed it to meet, seem more of a abrupt transition and rather than a soft transition, but we transition, we used to have what we called the organizational fit assessment as part of the application process. And that uh, we've moved to a different type of assessment 
we've always had a pilot skills assessment or pilot skills test. And historically, we conducted that uh, in our interview process. So the pilots that we selected didn't see that until much later in the selection process when they were on site doing their interview. We've transposed those assessments, if you will. And uh, because the pilot skills assessment or pilot skills test actually has some pretty amazing feedback on what we can expect from uh, performance and training and, and upgrades, not just initial training, but just continuation training and upgrades. We put that to the forefront of our application process and it's really a, a more or less aptitude or cognitive test, similar to what you'll see at, uh, I think several airlines have done something similar to that. And in reality, that has replaced the high cost and value of, of simulator time and doing a simulator assessment of years past. And it assesses and um, very, again, like I, I was mentioning is, it is a, a pretty accurate process. So it's not something that you can really study for, but I can tell you that uh, very rarely does someone do so poorly that they're not selected to move forward with that. That is just an assessment base point that goes into our overall composite assessment of a candidate moving forward. So. I wouldn't spend too much time being worried about failing or not failing that test. It is just a, a step that brings you forward uh, when the time comes. Thanks, Corey. Brian? Sure. Um, Corey, I have a question here in regards to Turbine PIC uh, and that number being determining factor for the scoring of your application. Um, this specific person says, I'm on the 7576, so I have the heavy aircraft time, but unfortunately, I've never had the opportunity to be in the left seat. So turbine PIC time is not something prevalent on my resume. Um, will that be a detriment in the near term for my application at American Airlines? That's a, a sort of a loaded question, but uh, it is not necessarily a detriment. I, I would tell you that uh, some of the things that we value, again, it's the whole person concept that is not an isolated piece that we evaluate, but it is something that historically has, once you've moved to the left seat of a, a transport category aircraft, whether that be an ERJ 145 or a Boeing 747, there are, you're, you're the last person to make the, the final decisions that affect the fate and safety of that aircraft. And there is, uh, for those of us that have spent time in the left seat, no matter how confident you are that you can handle that seat, there are a lot of things and considerations that open up and you expose yourself to that really haven't become a, a consideration when you're in the right seat. Some of those things, those pieces of information are, um, I've had the opportunity and at, at uh, both military and a couple of different airlines to sit both in the right seat and uh, make the upgrade to transition to the left seat. And every time that I've done that, not just the first time, there are some pieces that I learned, wow, these are things I thought I was doing as a good first officer, which really wasn't helping the overall situational awareness of the captain or helping the captain make the best decision. And likewise, in the left seat, I recognized, oh, these were things that uh, I could do better. So that, that those pieces and that experiences, those experiences are things that why all airlines, not just us, put some value in that, uh, that captain or left seat time. But the other part of that is that um, the type of flying that you do also matters. So flying transport category aircraft that are similar to what we fly, that bodes to the ability and experience of knowing some of the things that come up. And sometimes high SIC time also provides some of that valuable insight that you've done potentially oceanic crossings, you know IKO procedures as opposed to just domestic procedures. You've done some things that are, um, you've been exposed to some other um, emergencies or urgent situations that uh, just overall time building brings, brings you or exposes you to. So uh, I would not focus so much on that, but what I will say is in, in our whole person concept, I do like to see someone who spent more, who spends the time rather than chasing a seat and chasing uh, a larger airplane, spend time as uh, some loyalty to the company that you're flying for and build, building experience and progressing your career uh, at, at less destinations, I'll say, so that, so that we can see that long history of, of career progression. So a Brian Gambino opinion only, uh, I'm gonna throw that in your direction is that uh, 
SIC time, I say, is very valuable. You get a very good look at captains that you've flown with. Uh, for my 14 years in the airlines, I've never had the opportunity to move over the left seat, uh, both across regional carriers as well as now a major carrier that I've been at for seven years. So I'm, I'm a big fan of SIC time. We get to see the best and the, the worst of folks who are operating in other positions. So that, that's that's my plug for FOs are really great, really great experience, and they see they see a lot. So you take that for what it's worth, there, Corey. Uh, Troy, I'll pass it off to you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. So we have a question here uh, from Todd, um, and I think you mentioned this, Corey. When are you looking at opening up the application window again? Is the first part of the question. The second part is, do you have a timeline for beginning new hire classes? Um, I know you've mentioned this. Can you touch on that again? Sure. So uh, the first part of the question, what is the when the application will open up? We don't have a specific specific date yet. Again, there's a, a few minor tweaks before we turn the ignition key on and uh, start the engine, but those are wrapping up pretty quickly and we do anticipate to be on track for the, the last quarter of July. So probably sometime, um, you know, the last last 10 days or so of July for that to be turned on. It could be a little bit earlier, a little bit later. You can also expect us to make some announcements when that occurs. And, and of course, the, the splash banner on the application website will, will indicate when those are turned on as well. As far as uh, the second part of the question of new hire classes, those are still being kind of ironed out. And again, as I mentioned, our, our network requirements change on a daily basis. So uh, I would expect, you know, the hard part is for every pilot that we put in training, we have to. To, to pull some additional pilots into the training schoolhouse to bring them up to speed. So right now we're all hands on deck as uh, Captain Long mentioned before. And so in order to facilitate that, I would expect classes to start sometime after we've slowed down from the, the, the busy summer schedule. Thanks, Corey. Brian? Yes. Um, someone is asking here in regards to four year degree requirements, um, if you're not part of a, a American Airlines subsidiary flow program, is a four year degree also um, a determining factor in whether your application would be considered? Well, that's another question that we get frequently. And, and as we move forward in, in the interest of ensuring that we diversify our pilot selection, that is always going to be um, a factor that helps us determine the most competitive applicants. But it has never been a requirement for American Airlines to have a four-year degree. It's a preferred and it's certainly something that will add to your competitiveness, but it is not something that either eliminates you or puts you into the pool of selection. So um, I would say if you don't currently have a four-year degree, it might be worth the time if you have the ability and the means to start working towards one or continue working towards one. Um, we do also look at that. So, so folks that are currently actively enrolled in, in adding education in addition to their experience, that's something that we recognize and we, we know that not everybody has equal access to education or comes from the, a similar background. So in the interest of diversifying that, uh, we wanna bring people that have some varied backgrounds into the cockpit. Thanks very much. Troy? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I know this has been a statistic mentioned before. You guys uh, hire from your wholly owned pool and there's a lot of military applicants. So the question uh, is, how do you look at applicants outside of um, uh, your military applicants, folks coming out of the military and folks coming from your wholly owned? So that, that section of pilots there. Yeah, that's a that's also a question that I, I hear from time to time. Um, a lot of uh, uh, listen, I know that there's some numbers out there that make it seem like we don't look at anywhere that we look either our wholly owns are hired only through the flow, or that the majority of our selection come through uh, the the military route. That's not necessarily the case. When we look at the number of people that we actually select and advance forward. It's a lot more balanced than that. And, and what I see frequently are, um, we hire quite a bit from a lot of other carriers, air carriers besides our wholly owns, uh, other regional carriers, cargo carriers. Um, we definitely put some value in 121 flying. So 
135 flying doesn't necessarily carry as much weight, but we do take that on a case-by-case -case basis. The corporate flying is a lot less um, standardized across the board. And so it's, it's a lot more of a slippery slope when we say certain percentage come from corporate because it changes from time to time. Some, some corporate flying has a fleet of 20 aircraft and have maintenance and schedules that rival those of our carriers. Some of them have, you know, a, a CJ2 that they've been flying since 1970, and you know, it's it's put together with ball bearings. So it's it's tough to analyze that just from fleet type and time. We really do look at the whole person's concept and see, okay, what their experience has gone to. Has it been progressive? What what have they done in that role? Have they just been a pilot, or have they been doing things on the outside? And that that carries a lot more weight than where they came from or what their training experience was. Thanks for that, Corey. I, I got a follow-up question actually for you from a question we had earlier about the application. Um, the question is, is if you already have an application in, uh, when you open this new application window, will folks have to reapply or will they need to only go back to their old application and update that, continue to update that based on the new application window that's open? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, as I mentioned before, those applications have stayed intact and they can go in today and continually update that. And in fact, you know, that recency of update is one of our discriminators that we use because I can't tell if you're actively flying if you haven't updated it in two years. And, and I, quite frankly, that tells me that you may not be the most interested in coming to American Airlines. Then I see someone who's updated it five times in the last month and, you know, there's been changes and, and we can see all of that information. And then that tells me that's someone who's eager and excited to come work for American. Let me go look a little further into what they've changed and what they're doing and, and, and keep an eye on. So that is uh, for those that have applications on file to continue to update that, there's not going to be a reapplication process. That said, with the change in some of our, our assessments, that at some point you will still have to do that pilot skills test assessment. And at some point that uh, I believe has been turned on for everyone to see that already has an application on file, there's no time frame to get that com completed. Um, there's a time frame to complete it once you commence the testing, but whether you do that test today or you do that test in a month, that's not as important as just keeping your application updated. Thanks, Corey. Right. So this next question, I have a bit of an ulterior motive for when I ask it, but I'm going to let you answer first, and then I have something that I'm going to follow up with. Don't be, don't be worried, Corey. It's nothing bad. Um, job fairs, in-person job fairs. Does American Airlines have any plans in 2021 or know of any in-person job fairs that the American team might be attending? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, those are slowly rolling out, and and one of the things that occurred during uh, the pandemic is that. Um, we went back to, uh, myself included, I, I went back to flying the line. We kind of parked some things in our office. So right now that's where our, a lot of our energy is, is rebuilding that. So many of you may know uh, Patty Taylor, who has been the longtime pilot selection manager for American Airlines, uh, over two decades, retired last summer. And so because we weren't doing any active hiring at that point, we never backfilled that position. We also had some other internal team members that, that moved on to other positions and haven't backfilled them until, until this summer. So right now we're working on rebuilding our team and through the summer, that's probably where our focus is going to be. But I can't say, um, and, and from what I've seen, most of the major job fairs that we've participated in the past are being conducted virtually this summer. Uh, moving into the fall, um, the, first, the first actual one that we'll be participating in is in, in conjunction with the, the veterans organization, our tag. That'll be our first job fair uh, opportunity that our, we'll have actual recruiters at. And then going forward, our, our plan is to go back into our primary partnerships with the other organizations as they go back to in-person uh, job fairs and career opportunities. Awesome, good to hear. And here's, here's the ulterior motive piece that I had for everyone here listening. NGPA has had our industry expo event, which is rapidly grown to be uh, the second largest industry job fair event. And we can happily announce today that we will be back in person in 2022. We'll be the first ones to kick it off of the major job fairs. So mark your calendars now. February 10th and 11th, we'll be back to a two-day event. February 10th and 11th, we will be in everyone's loved and treasured Palm Springs, California, February 10th and 11th, 2022. 
Um, we are working right now to get all those plans in place. Normally, we have these things ironed out, contracts in place two years in advance. But obviously, with the pandemic, we took a hold on that to protect our organization financially. But we are rapidly uh, putting out plans now for our return to Palm Springs. Um, and you can follow along on our website, ngpa.org, on the events tab. You can hit the Industry Expo. All that information should be posted towards the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. But mark your calendars, February 10th and 11th. Corey, we'll see you there, I'm sure, in Palm Springs. So there, there is my ulterior motive for uh, asking that question. Thanks for playing along. Um, it is now full, I'm sorry, I got to go by which time frame we're in, 5.03 Eastern time. So we're a little over time. I have one more question for you, Corey, and then any closing thoughts that you might have uh, to finish things out. Uh, someone posted in here about um, training capacity. Are you familiar with what training capacity is like to really answer the demand that American is going to have over the next couple of years, not only in the short term, next couple of months, but next couple of years to cover uh, the amount of pilots that need to be hired? Um, and someone made mention of a, a closure of the Charlotte training facility and how that might play into capacity uh, restrictions on pilot hiring at American. Sure, I can answer that. Uh, but first, can uh and I'm not sure if you've made that announcement prior, but can I be the first to say American is going to be at the event in February for you guys? So we'll, we'll, I'm going to commit to that today right now. We'll, well be thank there. you. We appreciate that. You'll have your own separate room for our, for our lovely American Airlines Diamond Elite sponsor team. So um, American Airlines, you heard it there first, February 10th and 11th, American Airlines will be meeting people in person, shaking hands, hopefully, if possible. Absolutely. So uh, as far as training capacity goes, that is uh, that is very much the bottleneck, if you will, of our ability of hiring and meeting our requirements. So not only the capacity, but the time frame that it takes for us to get, that, get a pilot spooled up from off the street to flying an American Airlines aircraft. We are very cognizant of that. So a few things that have happened. So you mentioned our Charlotte uh, Training Center closing down. While that's closing down, we are moving all of our simulators and the support for that here to Dallas. So we'll have a consolidated one place for all of our training to occur. And that, what that does is a couple of things. First is it, it, it narrow, narrows the amount of travel and time that's committed to coming to and going from training events so that we can do all of that in the same place in the same space. And that is actually going to help us increase our capacity and be more efficient and effective with the simulators and the, uh, the training resources that we have. Another thing that we've done is that over the last uh, six months, we've transitioned from, historically, we've, we're have uh, we an AQP carrier for training purposes, which um, part of that requirement and our, our affiliation with that has historically been a nine month training cycle. We've moved to a 12 month training cycle to free up some available time for us to bring on new hires and conduct new hire training and in that increased interval for the recurrent training process. And then additionally, what we we have contracted with our uh, simulator providers and other training facilities, third party training facilities, so that we have our personnel utilizing or leasing, you could say, uh, other training facilities around the country to augment the training uh, resources that we have here at the uh, Dallas training facility. So those are kind of the three ways that we have led the charge on being able to handle that training capacity. And again, like I said, that's that's always a, uh, I have conversations on a regular basis each week talking about that specific issue. Cool. Well, thank you for covering that. Corey, I know your time is uh, limited and valued. Thank you for giving your time here to make this presentation. Uh, to all of our attendees here at our Up in the Air webinar series and the continued commitment that American Airlines has to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and specifically to uh, us here at NGPA. We value the partnership. We value the relationship. Uh, thank you for learning from our organization, learning from our members, and uh, we continue to look forward to learning from American as we continue to grow our organization. Here at NGPA, we are a volunteer-run organization. We have a staff of one. Uh, that's Luke. Uh, so a big thanks to Luke, who's running our technology in the background for all of this year. Um, passion project for all of our other volunteers across NGPA to keep this organization running and to continue bringing you content like this right here at uh, Up in the Air. So please do, oh, my hotel room phone is ringing, sorry. Uh, please do uh, head to our website at ngpa.org. 
and uh, click in the top right and hit the join now button uh, to become a member and to continue to support all the services that NGP has and continue to be up on uh, the upcoming events that our organization is hosting as well. To the whole American Airlines team, Corey, thank you very much for being with us. To Captain Chip Long, to Captain Lori Klein, and of course, to that fantastic message from Doug Parker. We greatly appreciate your efforts and time. And we, uh, we wish you a lot of luck as you uh, take on all the hiring needs that are coming down the pipe for you all at American Airlines. On behalf of all of us here at NGPA, on behalf of our board of directors, our executive leadership team, Myself, your president, Brian Gambino, and Troy Merritt, our vice president, and of course, our operations manager, Luke. Thanks for joining us. We have more up in the air content coming your way. You can follow that at www.ngpa.org forward slash up in the air. Um, our new schedule will be posting soon. We are going to be welcoming back our friends at Delta Airlines probably in the middle to end of July as they have some really interesting updates on the pilot hiring process at Delta. So be on the lookout for that to be posted. And we hope to see you at that as well as some general aviation content with none other than Barry Schiff, an American Airlines pilot, an incredible legend uh, in the flight training world and general aviation. He'll be joining us in the beginning of August to share some information about us of dusting off the COVID rust and jumping back into a general aviation aircraft. If you missed the email addresses for American Airlines, they're going to be on a screen just after this. Um, thanks again for joining us, everybody. Continue to take care of yourselves, take care of each other, be safe up there in the air, and we'll see you next time at our NGPA Up in the Air webinar series. From all of us here at NGPA, have a great rest of your week, folks. Bye-bye now.